Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, with me again tonight, as usual, is Brother Jason Cripps. Uh, and Sister Renee may join us uh, if she's able. Uh, it's I'm not really sure if she could be able to make it just because she's been in a lot of pain. So whether she is able to join us tonight or not, uh, everybody just pray for her. Uh, just keep on praying for her and uh, her all the health problems she's has to deal with. Uh, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last last week. Uh, we finished up with Romans chapter three, so we're going to start tonight with Romans chapter one, um, chapter four, verse one. But first, let me ask Brother Cripps, say hi to everybody, introduce yourself to those who may not know you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Cripps, and uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Hello to everyone in the chat room. Um, I have a channel that I'm part of, part of a great panel of people that uh, we meet on Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, and it's called True Story Live. So thank you for that, Brother Luke. And I'm excited about the study tonight. I'll, I'll keep it short because I'm ready to get at it. All right, very good. Uh, so everybody get your Bibles ready if you don't have them and go along with us. Starting with uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now, of course, uh, brother, you, you know that uh, when these letters were written, for that matter, when all the scriptures were written, they were written without chapter divisions and, and, and verse addresses. And uh, these things were added later. And some yep. people some people actually uh, b really believe that uh, the numbering system, chapter and verse numbering system, uh, also is inspired and that uh, there's some significance and profound uh, meanings that you can find in it. <laughs> and, uh, I found that uh, me, there, there's probably some cases where we might discover something like that, but. Sure. Uh, I think that uh, we need to realize that sometimes it, what, when a chapter begins, it maybe it's not a beginning of a totally new thought. It's a continuation of what was being said before. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, have you noticed, though, that uh, when we did the, um, the, the study on the chapter one and two and three, and we did our uh, acting and our played our, our roles with, with Paul and the, and the false teacher, uh, that um, that concept of prosopopoeia seems very obvious. So I'm going to be on the lookout for that as we continue to see if we can find any indication of it any further. But one thing that I see here in this first verse is this, this technique that Paul uses, and we're going to see this a lot. Uh, he asks a question. What shall we say then? Mm hmm that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Yeah. Uh, so what it's do you like th it, what it's is like <laughs> asking questions, you think? I, well, yeah, um, as you have kind of alluded to before, you know, back in that time, even in the writing of letters, they didn't have, or I, I had said this last week, I think, that um, they didn't have the technology that we have today. They didn't have uh, televisions and radios and all that stuff. They didn't have movie theaters. So um, these things were read, right, to groups of people. So I believe that this is Paul's personality. And, it, and when he says that phrase, it's kind of like, what else is there for us to say? That would be mm -hmm. the tone. That's the tone I hear when he says it. You know, yes. what, what else is there for us to say? This is the way this is. This is what's going on, you know, like that, in a kind of dramatic way. Mm -hmm. um, that's the take I, I give on it. That's why when you introduce this uh, prosopopoeia idea and we uh, read it out and acted it out, um, I could uh, feel it and understand it in that way better than I could had I just read it straightforward with all the chapter breaks and verses and whatnot. Mm, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm seeing YouTube censorship says old tech was ahead of ours. You know, we're talking about that's true. Yeah, it's uh, that's true. YouTube t uh, censorship. That's absolutely true. But I'm talking about from from the time that we're referring to when Paul was around. Uh, they didn't have that tech at that time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I think that uh, it very well may be true that in, in ancient times, long, long ago, that uh, things were far more advanced than, than uh, the world uh, imagines. But I don't have necessarily a lot of proof about all that. But I well, think- there's there's proof. There's there's proof in that they found things. They haven't been able to hide everything, and that's a whole different show. But I'm just saying that. There are pictures of things and there are uh, images and uh, documentation that show that before the flood, they had uh, little model uh, airplanes and whatnot, just for an example. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So, but Paul, uh, uh, apart from the prosopopoeia, a technique that everybody should be able to agree mm-hmm. uh, he uses is uh, the asking questions. Yes. Uh, and then answering them, answering the questions, or asking us to think, provoking our thought here. And he asks here, uh, uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? And then they amplified, it says, what then shall we say that Abraham our forefather, humanly speaking, has found? well, let's go on and see if Paul provides the answer for us, but it's good for everybody to think about that for a moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, what you, and, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Uh, so what, what uh, you started out at the beginning, and then I, I lost what verse you went to. So what verse are we going to be on now? Uh, verse 2, chapter 4. Okay, so gotcha. Now, now he continues. After the question, he says, For... If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Brother, I, I think that, uh, that that's one of the most important things that a person needs to understand. In all of Christianity, this is where probably 90% of the people who don't understand the real gospel, they don't understand this basic point here in verse 2. Give me, mm. give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, the, here, here it is. It's the crux of everything. Uh, so, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So, what it says to me is that maybe in in front of man who have this men who have the same idea of being justified by works before God, it's not justification at all. Mm-hmm. That's what it means to me, and it, it, uh, what I meant by the crux of everything, you know, this is the ongoing arg- argument of faith versus works. You know, are we justified by works or are we justified by faith? Well, we would all say and we would all teach that we're only justified by faith, and that is correct. But that system of works is still ingrained, and it has been for quite some time, and people just can't, it's hard for them to separate from it. I mean, it, it's, uh, in some ways, it's built into our uh, how we are as people. It makes sense to people that you would need to do some works, that, and, and it makes it harder for them to understand grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember in, the, in chapter 3, chapter 3 is very, very important because this is when he initially starts laying this foundation that uh, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Mm-hmm. So, uh, is a key point to get. And then yep. another key point is, he says, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of, of, of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Uh, therefore, we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Yes. So that was the primary thing he wants us to understand in chapter 3. Yes. And and, and now he's, he's continuing on talking about this glorying, another word for glorying would be boasting, wouldn't it? Yes, glorying in yourself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So he's saying, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. And I would put that in my words. He would be able to boast. Yes. But not before God. Yes. Let me see how the Amplified phrases that. I gave you my paraphrase of it. It says, For if Abraham was justified, that is, if he was acquitted from the guilt of his sins by works, those things he did that were good, he has something to boast about. Well, there you go. 
but not before God. No. Yeah. Um, I've said this. Um, I've made this point in a lot of videos, brother. Um, and, and, matter of fact, we just, I was just asking you earlier, did you see the video I, I made uh, the other day about uh, are we casting our pearls before swine? And you're yeah. on, it's, you've got it on your to watch list. But one of the main things I points I'm making there and I keep making it and I, I will keep drive, trying to drive this point home is that Jesus showed love, grace, mercy to the to what uh, most people would think were the are like the real sinners, the, the, the tax collector, those Jewish people that were so low, they would collect taxes from their own people for Rome yeah, and charge uh, them more. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and prostitutes. Yep. Adulteresses. Yeah. But Jesus was loving and gracious to them. Who did he really just punch out verbally? The, <laughs> the religious, yes. uh, self-righteous, full of spiritual pride. He called them snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, hypocrite, hypocrite. He repeated eight times in a period of a few verses. Hypocrite. Yep. So the point that I hope everybody understands is that it seems to me God is very understanding about our sins of all kinds. But for some reason, spiritual pride and self-righteousness really perturbs God. Yeah. And you know why? I'm, I mean, I know you know why. I mean, it 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 perturbs God because that that makes it impossible to reconnect with Him. If someone's in their own pride and they think that that the the works of their own hands are what's going to save them, they're not going to be saved. You can't be saved that way. You can't reconcile with God in that way. So I think they're further away from God than someone that's a prostitute or a tax collector. The, the attitude is completely different, in, the, in, in at least as far as they're concerned and as far as God's concerned. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, uh, when he, in, in Matthew 7, I think it is, where he says, there'll come a day when they come before me saying, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful works we did in your name. And they start rattling off all their good works. And Jesus is not impressed. No. He says, these are works of iniquity. Yeah. Depart from me, I never knew you. Uh, so the idea that if anybody thinks that they could go before God and plead their case, because there will be a judgment. And if you had to plead your case before God, what are you going to say to God about why should God let you into heaven? Are you going to say, look at all the works I did, Lord. Mm. And I did it all in your name. Oh, look, I've worked so hard. Yeah. Right. I, I, I. Me, me, me. Yeah. Yeah. Boasting before God, the nerve that people have thinking that their works have any value to God for salvation, then that's why the Bible says, uh, I think it says in, in Isaiah, and, and then I think Paul repeats it, but uh, our works are like filthy rags. Yes. Right. Yes. So um, the idea of glorying, getting, you know, there's a, these five solas of the Reformation, you know, uh, uh, I, I talk about that a lot because I do think that's the one thing that came out of the Reformation that is important for people to understand mm -hmm. and that is um, sola scriptura. Okay? Yeah. We, we don't get our form our conclusions based upon uh, the thoughts and theories of, of, of our other people and, and uh, theologians or philosophers, we get our conclusions from what the Bible tells us. The scriptures Amen. alone. Scriptures alone. Amen. Now, the other glories, I mean, the other solas are uh, sola uh, gracia, means only grace. It's only because God is gracious. That's that right. Saved. Yeah. Not because we have personal merit, we don't deserve it but because God's gracious to us. It's only because of faith, not Amen. because of any religious works we present to God. Amen. Uh, and it's only faith in Jesus. We can have faith. A lot of people have faith in their own works. They have faith in religious systems, mm -hmm. but your faith must be only in Christ. Sola Cristo. And then only in those ways can 
be, be sola gloria. All the glory is for God. You don't claim any glory for yourself. And no. that's what Paul is saying right here. Let's go back to the verse. Sometimes I go off on a wild tangent. And I get excited. No, no, that one, what you what just you said there is not a good. tangent. Okay, well, yeah, I am trying to connect the dots here. You he are. Says, he says, he hath whereof to glory, but not to God. So if you think that you can take some glory for yourself, but the only God deserves, you think you can boast to God about your good works when your works are nothing but filthy rags uh, regarding your salvation, mm -hmm. uh, then you're, uh, you're in for a big shock. You're going to hear those <laughs> words like Jesus said. He, he oh. warned them. There's going to come a day when people are going to hear this from me. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. That's right. And I, I don't ever want to be in that position. That's the last thing I want. It, it, it's haunted me. You know, I mean, until I um, was uh, had the full assurance of the salvation, which has been some time ago. Um, but that verse still comes up in my head. You know, sometimes it's like being in that position where you're standing before God and he says those words to you. I never knew you. That's the other one. I never knew you. Who wants to hear that? Mm -hmm. What one of us here listening to this broadcast wants to hear that from God? Not me. I know that much. Praise God through his grace. I don't ever have to hear that. And neither does anyone else here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, brother, uh, that's something you don't need to worry about. Yep. Or ever be concerned about because you will not have to plead your case to God. No. Uh, you, 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 you've, uh, your, your case has already gone to court and settled. You know, you Amen. are already declared righteous. Praise uh, God. Because Jesus is righteousness. Is credit That's right. You. We're going to come into a verse soon uh, that points that out. Excellent. But, uh, uh, the people who have not put their faith in Jesus, that's the position they're going to be in. They're going to go to this judgment and see and, and, and have to plead their case. And, and mm -hmm. they're already condemned. They're really only there to be sentenced. Uh, but uh, because th 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 there's nothing they can do to justify themselves. No. Um, so uh, let's go. On. One thing, one. I just want to add one thing real quick. You know, a lot of times when people talk about um, people in hell, and they talk about the wailing and gnashing of teeth, and a lot of people think that that's because of uh, of the pain that they're undergoing. And I really think it's their anger and hatred for God, and realizing that all the work that they did, that they felt justified in their own eyes, didn't cut it, and that you have to deal with that for a very, very long time. Um. I, I just think a lot of it's going to be the uh, the realization that that they didn't make it in, and that their works meant nothing to him, and the uh, the weight of that, the pain of that. Um, I don't think it's just a physical pain. I think it's an internal, just an internal wailing and gnashing of teeth that comes from the inside, and just their wickedness. Just a theory. Yeah. Uh, well, I can see that uh, Adeste in the chat room has a question for us. I, I, I can answer part of this question, but I don't want to, that we're, we're trying to get through this chapter of Romans, so I don't want to go off uh, back into Genesis, but I can, I give you a brief answer, Adeste. Uh, um, he says, you, you got, can you guys explain what God is saying to Cain based on his sacrifice? Well, Cain and Abel, I, I'm pretty darn sure even though it's not explicitly stated in the scriptures, I'm pretty sure that their parents, Adam and Eve, taught them what they needed to know. And God, um, God showed Adam and Eve that the works of their hands, their efforts, could not solve their problem of their nakedness. Mm -hmm. They tried to, through their own efforts, cover up their nakedness by sewing together fig leaves, and, and God... So that's not going to solve the problem. So God killed an animal, and it had to have its blood shed and took the skin of the animal and covered Adam and Eve with the animal skin. Right. This is the first principle or the first picture of Shadow. the gospel to come. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a, the fact is Adam and Eve had to learn that you you're, the problem you have uh, you cannot rectify it. You need no. God to rectify it for you. But God 
the name Jesus means God saves. God will save Adam and Eve. He says, I'll save you. I'll solve your problem. But it's going to require death and blood, shed blood. Yeah. And so I'm sure that Adam and Eve learned that lesson. And they taught Cain and Abel. Yeah. But Cain, it, when it's come time to make his uh, uh, sacrifice to God, he wanted to impress God with his own works the way that um, Adam and Eve did. Look what I've done. Look what I produced. I've worked so hard in the farm, produced his crop. Yeah. But he should have known. I'm sure he was taught. God says, I require a blood sacrifice. And that's the sacrifice Abel gave God. And that's why God was pleased because he wants everybody throughout history to realize that, wait, it's going to take a blood sacrifice and nothing yeah. else is going to do. Mm -hmm. So willful disobedience on the part of Cain. Yeah. Yeah. I agree uh, with you that they had to know. Uh, that's that's all I want to say is that that they they knew the the right way and Cain chose his own way. That's the attitude again. It's mm -hmm. people doing it in their own power and not doing what God requires. And it's even easier for us at this point on this side of the cross because the the payment's already been made. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's just us accepting it. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. mm, beautiful. Yeah. So. Uh, we'll go to the verse 3 now, uh, Romans 4, verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? Now, I'm going to stop there because that's what we ever, that should be our default. Yeah. We always have to ask, what saith the Scripture? Mm -hmm. And if someone asks a question, well, what about Cain this and that? Explain that to me. I'm going to use the Scriptures and I'll try to piece it together. Uh, sometimes we have to make some assumptions and we have to surmise based upon what we know. Some things are not stated explicitly and we have to try to figure it out. And that's part of studying and learning the word of God. But what saith the scriptures, Paul mm -hmm. says. He says, you want the answer to this first question? What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found well, he asks the question and he answers it. He says, for what saith the scriptures? Let's go to the scriptures to find out the answer. And he continues, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay, brother, tell me, tell me about that verse. Um, okay, so again, if we if we look at the whole uh, uh, part of the chapter that, that we've read so far, Again, I think it's the, I think it's more the attitude of um, him being kind of um, incredulous. Like uh, I, I, when I think of it now, I, I think of him saying, well, "What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh that found?" And you know, it's kind of that attitude. So when he says, "For what saith the Scripture?" It's kind of, you know, it's saying it like this. So what does what does the scripture say, guys? It's kind of that attitude to me. Um, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. There's the answer. Yeah. His faith, uh, his faith is what counted unto him righteousness before the cross. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, some people will argue, and using the Book of James, that. Um, um, it's, it's the actions that Abraham took that justified him. Um, Who says that now? The book of James. He oh. talks about the same portion of scriptures about how, how Abraham was justified. And he says, James says that Abraham was justified by his, his work. The fact that he was willing to sacrifice his son showed his, uh, justified him. But Paul argues, no, he was justified by faith. Yeah. And by believing, and uh, so people will argue that well, James is talking about being justified in man's sight. I disagree with that interpretation of it, but I don't want to get sidetracked telling you all my opinions about the Book of James. Yeah, let's not. <laughs> I, will, I will say that um, uh, what did when it says that Abraham believed God? Let me read it exactly. Here it says, it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So here it's saying that he was counted or considered righteous because he believed God. 
Okay. That's it. It doesn't say it, it was because of the actions that he took. It's not even he believed God. They're not even mentioned here. Yeah. Right. Uh, but here's something else for everybody to consider. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of people talking about, you know, how perfect our faith has to be and, and how we should never have any doubts. And, and uh, I certainly, uh, I, I want people to be absolutely convinced and never have any doubts because when you have doubts and you, your faith wanes or gets shipwrecked, it's a tragic thing. Uh, you don't lose your salvation if that happens to ha happen, but it's tragic. Because the, the saddest thing is a, a, a believer that, uh, you know, has doubts and, and is uh, uh, worried, worried about their salvation. That's very sad. Yeah. Uh, but let's look at Abraham and Sarah for a moment here. Do you remember when uh, uh, God told Abraham that he would have a, a, a child with Sarah and yes. that that his family line would become like the stars in the sky, a huge nation of people. Mm -hmm. And all the nations of the world would be blessed through this genealogy. Mm -hmm. That's what God told him. And that's what, that's what Abraham believed, right? He believed it. He believed God. And because he believed God and he proved it by packing up everything and moving across the country, he didn't know where he was going, but he trusted God. And, and, uh, and then he was even willing to sacrifice his son. So those things kind of like uh, demonstrated his faith. But it was not those things that justified him to God. It was his believing. Yeah. Ever, brother, do you remember <laughs> what happened with uh, uh, Sarah and mm -hmm. Hagar? Yes. He, they went ahead of God, didn't they? Sarah was old, and she started doubting God's promise. Yeah. She was first before Abraham doubted. Yes. Yeah. It was like Adam, Eve with Adam, Sarah with Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, Eve led Adam astray. Sarah mm -hmm. led Abraham astray. Sarah mm -hmm. stopped believing God's promise because she's old and barren. And mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're 90 years old. You think you're going to have a child? It right. has to be a miracle. That's why God may waited so long, brother, because because we all know that it had to be a miracle for a 90 year old woman to give birth. It was. So and that's exactly what happened. But what she did was cause Abraham to mm -hmm. doubt also. Yeah. Because I think he had to doubt because he did give in. Otherwise he could have said, no, Sarah, I'm not going to have a, a child with a handmaiden Hagar to satisfy you. Cause I believe God's going to keep his promise and he'll, we'll get our child that way, the way God said, no, he didn't stand up to her. He conceded to her position. And so in my opinion, Abraham doubted. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I would have to, I would have to agree. I mean, it, we know that he did in those moments, you know, in, in the, in the moment when his, his wife, I mean, I get the, I get the idea that his wife comes to him and she's like, when is this problem? Now, by the way, before I say this, this is all just in, in my own head, uh, as a, as a reading or whatever. But, um, I imagine her coming to Abraham and said, how long is this going to be? When is this God going to, uh, give us the son that he's promised? We're, we're already old. I can't wait anymore. When is this going to happen? And it probably just wasn't one night. This this may have gone on for a period of time before Adam gave in or before Abraham gave in. I, we don't know for sure. But at the point when Abraham gave in, then he was part of the, the whole scenario to, uh, to begin with. Um, but her, her doubt, her antsiness and not waiting on the Lord, she moved before God. Uh, wanted them to move, and then Abraham joined in with it as well. So there had to have been doubt. I can't imagine Abraham sleeping with Hagar and just thinking the, the whole the whole time that, yeah, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God. I, I don't know how that would be possible. If someone trusts God, um, well, in their human condition, I understand where it can happen. But outside of that, if you trust God, then you're not going to move ahead of him. And, and yet, Abraham is listed in Hebrews chapter of the champions of faith as one of the great heroes of faith. Yeah, because God doesn't look at that one instance. 
Yeah. Not right. He doesn't look at one thing that we've done in our past and judge us on that one thing, especially because of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we all have that grace. We all have the grace of God, not looking at all the sin and all the horrible things we've done and hold that up against us because Christ paid the ultimate price. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let me, uh, let me look at this verse in the Amplified, see how it's stated there. Verse three says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in, that is, he trusted and relied on God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness, that is, right living, right standing with God. Um, you know, every once in a while, the Amplified says something, and I will object. But most of the time, I find it enlightening and clarifying. And I think in this case, it's, it's, it, they stated it very well. Yeah, you talked about this last week, too. So anyone that doesn't remember, yeah. The, um, I, so far, I hadn't heard a lot from this particular version. But after hearing you talk about it, it makes it makes sense that it's a companion. And then where it doesn't match with the King James Version, then you, you can throw that part out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, okay, I got Brother Cripps, I got Brother Amplified, and me. And we're having this conversation, and you, I'm asking Brother Cripps, would you amplify that verse for me, brother? Tell me, expand upon your, tell me a little bit, what's that mean? And the Amplified is basically doing the same thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, now let's go to the verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Brother? Yeah, you have it. We have a debt of sin to pay for. We we do each one of us without God. If we're without God, who pays the debt of our sin? Jesus paid the debt, but if we don't accept what He's done, then the debt falls on us, doesn't it? Well, the way I see see this verse is it's it's intended to uh, the the work and the reward is if someone is working for their salvation then uh, what would God would, um, um, would give them for their work, um, it's not really grace. No. It, it, it's, it's debt. Because, yeah. Again, let me illustrate. You, go, you, you die, you, you don't believe in Jesus for your salvation entirely. You believe in Jesus plus your work. So you go work for God, and he says, why should I let you into heaven? And you start boasting about all your, your works, and then you even say, I did all this work for you, Lord. You owe me. Yeah. You're in my oh. debt. Oh. That's what he's saying here is you can't try to think that because you work, God owes you. Wow. I can't imagine thinking that, but people will. That's the only logical assumption that they make, thinking that, hey, I'm working for my salvation. I, I've earned it, and God, God owes me because I, I did what it was required of me. They, they're so full of themselves. They think they're good enough to qualify for heaven on their own merit. That's, that's really all you can conclude is that they think that God owes them. Well, yeah. So think about a, a T. I won't mention names, but let, let's think about a popular TV minister that spends all his time, you know, on the TV and getting people to come to his, his, uh, his uh, ministries and uh, flying around the country and going to different places. Maybe he even goes overseas. Maybe he spends time in war-torn countries or in, in uh, places where uh, most of the people live in, under the poverty level line. And they do that their entire lives. So then they die and stand before God, and they haven't accepted Christ's free gift. So what else do they have to base it on? They're going to base it on everything that they did. What I did this and I, I didn't, you know, I could have lived a different life. I could have, I could have not done anything for you, but look at all I did. And then their answer is going to be, dude, you're a worker of iniquity, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I could not imagine for me personally, I would never think, I would dare to go before God and say, I did this and this and this. I deserve heaven. You owe me. You're in my debt. I'll tell you where I'll be. I'll be on my knees before him with my face on the ground. And e even knowing that um, I've accepted God's gift. And that's, that's, that's where I'll be. Just, just in awe of him. That's all. Right. Jesus is my savior. Jesus. Yep. Oh, 
Jesus is my savior. That's all I'm going to say. That's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, and praise God to have that ability to, to be able to be that way in front of him, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that Christ paid the price and that we've accepted it. And for that reason, we're a different, we're um, in a different judgment. Yeah. yeah. Now let's look at verse four in the Amplified. It says, now to a laborer, his wages are not credited as a favor or a gift, but as an obligation, something owed to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's accurate. Okay. Now let's go to verse five in the KJV. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And there it is. Now, this verse here has always been on my top evangelism verses All right. uh, to prove to someone that thinks works are required. Yep. Uh, and I've always argued that this is verse is saying it. You can take a person who didn't do one single work for salvation their whole life. They never did one good work. Yes. But they had faith, and therefore they're declared righteous. Amen. Uh, so that's how I've always used the verse. Yeah. However, I heard Brother Daniel talk about this maybe maybe almost a year ago. Where somehow he, he was using this verse and uh, talking about this verse, and he looked at it a little bit differently. And I'm inclined to believe that that is the better way of understanding it. And that is, let's read it in the Amplified, because the Amplified interprets the verse the way I think we should understand it, even though I like the way I just presented it, because it's a really good verse to say, look, even if work could do, a person does zero work, yeah. they're going to be justified by their faith. Well, it's true. So, zero work is required. But yeah. the way we should understand it, listen to this. But to the one who does not work, that is the one who does not try to earn his salvation by doing good. See, in other words, the reason this is that this different take on it is significant is that when it says, but to him that worketh not, that that's not just telling me that a person is not required to do even one work. That's telling me that to the person who is not working for their salvation. Yeah. Doesn't have the attitude that I'm going to earn my salvation through my own works. No, they're not. They've rejected that idea entirely. They're not even considering that their works are going to contribute to their salvation. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the person it's talking about. To the person who never even considers his works are, are worthy and, and is not using that for his justification at all. They're not thinking about it in any way, because yeah. the second part of the verse de de declares it. But believeth, that's the answer, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Yes. So the, fir the first part, um, but to him that worketh not, so that, that just is very, very simple. They're not working for it. Yeah. They know they can't. They're not, even, they're not even considering it, just like you said. Yeah. And then the answer is, but believeth on him. Believeth on who? Jesus Christ. That justifieth the ungodly. That's that's being justified by faith. Mm -hmm. His faith is counted for righteousness. It's so super clear. I love it. So this this verse is not only a proof text that, that zero work is required by us, mm. but it's also telling us that you better be someone who's not working for your salvation. Yeah. If you are working for your salvation, this does, doesn't apply to you. You will never be redeemed righteous because you've got to be someone who's not working for it. Yeah. It doesn't measure up. It doesn't measure up. It doesn't even come close to measuring up. Let's see the rest of this in the Amplify. It says, but to the one who does not work, that is the one who does not try to earn his salvation by doing good, but believes and completely trusts in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited to him as righteousness. That is, he's in right standing with God. Mm -hmm. It's interesting they added that other part on there. That uh, uh, rather than just saying, uh, will you read that part again? The the uh, comparison between but believeth on him and the amplified. Mm -hmm. But believes and completely trusts in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited to him 
as righteousness. That is the right standing with God. Okay, completely trusts. That's the thing. What does that remind you of? Completely trusts. Yes. It's foolish, full assurance. <laughs> it, yes. It's similar to that. It's similar to that, the idea of full, full assurance to me. Completely trust, yes. Yeah, completely trust. That's that. Well, I like that, actually. Um, that just that one phrase a little bit more than the King James uh, version. Yeah, the, uh, the Amplified often inserts, when it talks about believing in salvation, it often inserts the words that I think that we need to really emphasize, and that is, relies upon, depends upon, trusts in. You know, he, these are words that uh, uh, make the point, I, I think, even more clearly than what believe or faith, because if people are misrepresenting even what the word believe and faith means. Amen. I agree with that, hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Let me look at the chat room and see. If, by the way, chat room, if you're um, if you have a question about anything we're saying here for us, please type it in bold uh, in uh, all caps. That's the way it stands out to me. I'll re I'll recognize that it's a question for us, but try to keep the questions relevant to the subject we're on. Okay. Uh, all right. So now let's go to. Uh, Verse 6 in the KJV, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. I had to put those two verses together to complete the thought. Go, go ahead, brother. Okay, but to him, uh, we did that one. Even uh, so, we're at verse 6, correct? Verse 6. And seven, I read them together. I got you. I got you. Um, uh, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed. Okay, so this is us. This is us right here. Imputed righteousness, which is one of the most beautiful phrases in Scripture. It is the reason why uh, we don't have to worry about um, being rejected by God when we stand before him. If we have his imputed righteousness, that's the card. That's the mm -hmm. card that we have that we carry with us um, into his into his presence. That's the uh, uh, full of full assurance that we are accepted by him is the imputed righteousness without works. There's the other point again. He uh, he keeps going back to it without works. He's convincing people even back then. Um, it was a huge problem then, as you very well know. And it's still a huge problem now. People just can't get away from that. So then verse 7, saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven. Okay, again, that's us. Our iniquities are forgiven by what Christ did on the cross. Mm -hmm. And whose sins are covered. Again, our sins are covered. Though uh, they were as scarlet, they've been washed as white as snow. And Jesus is the one that did that. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a, a difference, though, between what David says and what Paul says. Remember uh, earlier, we found in Paul's letter uh, the, the word propitiation. Yes, he talked about that last week. Yeah, we, we make a big deal about that word because propitiation is different than atonement. And uh, I would say it's different than this word covered here because David says whose sins are covered because at, in David's time and and uh, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, all they could do was cover the sins with, with blood. And, and it was a temporary uh, uh, covering, but they were not washed away and removed and cast as far as the east is from the west and never remembered anymore like they are now. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's uh, the distinction of the word covered here, the word that... The G, that uh, that David would use, whose sins are covered, is uh, we should be thankful that, hey, our sins are not just covered. Yeah. Our sins are completely removed, paid for. Amen. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he uses and there? Why do you think it's ne it's necessary for him, David, I guess? This is a quote then. Uh, um, if, we, if we go, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, I don't have the actual, I thought there'd be a footnote for us to find the verse here, but I don't see it. Usually the Amplify gives us a footnote when there when they're references a Old Testament verse. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I'll, I'll let me read it in the Amplified anyway. Yeah. But, uh, it says, and in this same way, David speaks of the blessing on the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Mm -hmm. Blessed and happy and favored are those whose lawless acts have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered up and completely buried. Buried. Yeah. So out of sight, out of mind, you know, they're covered up, they're buried, but they haven't been washed away and removed uh, until Jesus' death because the, the blood of goats and cows and bulls, that, 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 uh, uh, that doesn't really uh, solve the sin problem. You had no. to have Jesus' death to solve the sin problem. Amen. So David is before the cross. Uh, that that's the thing. So he knew this; these things were coming. He knew that there would be a savior that would come and wipe away everything. But uh, from his perspective, then he knew that the sins were covered. Yeah, covered, uh, not there removed. May be, there may be more uh, psalms that indicate this, but uh, uh, Psalm twenty-two is uh, prophetic about Jesus's uh, suffering and death. Psalm 22, that was a thousand years before Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 53, another chapter that talks, describes his death, burial, resurrection. Uh, that was 700 years before Jesus. So these are prophecies many centuries before it happened. And these prophecies are really what some people need the, that to convince them in the first place to believe. Yeah. Uh, what happened with me is I wasn't aware of those. I, I became a believer before I knew about all these prophecies. Uh, but when I learned about the prophecies and how detailed they were in hundreds, even a thousand years beforehand, um, uh, those prophecies reinforced and strengthened and solidified my the faith that I already had to, to be. So, hey, there's a... My faith is supported now with so much evidence. So much evidence. Yeah. Just real quickly, how did that happen where you weren't aware of the, did you just get a little New Testament or something? Well, you didn't... yeah, when, when, when I got saved, uh, uh, I started reading the Bible with uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, mm -hmm. and John. Sure, and sure. As I'm reading John, I became a believer, and um, John's the book that really put it all together for me. But... I didn't go back and read, you know, the Old Testament that immediately. I, uh, I didn't start with the Old Testament. Matter of fact, I don't think a person's going to even understand much of the Old Testament unless they first understand the New Testament. Oh my gosh! Say that again. You you can't understand the Old Testament uh, unless you understand the New Testament. Yeah, uh, I, I I agree with that. There's a lot of people that would argue against that, but there, there's a saying that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, concealed within it. Like Adeste asked, "Well, what about this Cain and Abel situation?" Yeah, and and I I talked about one Adam and Eve's uh, covering with the fig leaves, but that was their own works, but. God provided salvation, the, the solution to their nakedness by providing an animal skin. And that was death and shed blood was needed to do it. Mm -hmm. So that was the first indication of this uh, a prophetic picture of something to come in the future. They didn't get it at that time. A lot of these things, like in the Old Testament, that we understand the meaning of it now, they didn't understand it. But we have the benefit of hindsight now because we can look back and say, aha! That's a picture of his, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, Cain, Cain's sacrifice of works versus um, Abel's sacrifice of blood, mm. and death and blood. That was acceptable. So uh, on and on. I have a playlist that I made titled uh, The Bloody Trail, and it's probably 20 or 30 examples like that where we go over all these pictures and shadows. Renee's going to make a movie about the, about the pictures and shadows in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, Kate, uh, that hey, there's going to be some shed blood in the future for salvation of man. Yeah, I hope I hope to be involved with that in some way, with voiceovers or whatever. Yeah, I hope you are. Thanks. Uh, do what I can too. That's a, it's a wonderful idea. It is. Can't wait. Mm -hmm. All right, verse eight. Are we ready? Yeah. Let me see. Verse eight. Uh, why don't you, yeah, you, you seem a uh, rarer to go. Why don't you read, uh, you, you do the reading part for a little while. Yeah, no problem. So verse eight, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. 
and even in this way, I mean, I agree with what you're saying about there were no chapter breaks or ver you know verses that it was just all together. But do you see even in this in this sense, it's separated from the other the other uh, verses, uh, and it, it, there's even spaces there. This verse alone is huge. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. It seems like a, I, gosh, um, yes. Uh, every one of us that have accepted his gift are blessed because the Lord is not imputing our sin unto us. It was put on Christ and it was paid for. It's beautiful, verse 8. Yeah, well, blessed um, um I'm not saying that you can always interpret it the same way every time. No. Blessed means that you've received something wonderful, a blessing. Um, something really wonderful has happened to you. That's being blessed in some way. But also, uh, in some translations, particularly in, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, when it says blessed is blessed is, blessed is, all these different examples of being blessed, um, some translations say happy is happy is the person that uh, doesn't cover it yeah so happy um if you're blessed it's going to make you happy so it's true that when you're blessed you can say you're happy but it, you're happy because you received some kind of a blessing uh but if you look at that in the amplified uh, that gets a little sticky though because the world tells us that that's uh something to strive for is being happy yeah. okay so here this actually the amplifier is making the point I just made because I'm saying that uh, you're you're going to be happy if you're blessed okay and the amplified translated blessed and happy and favored is the man whose sin the lord will not take into account nor charge against him sure yeah so it's a blessing that makes me happy because god has favored me uh, and uh, is not holding any of my sins against me. Think, think about it as a man who's who's being acquitted of a of a lifetime of crime. But, I mean, think about it as a man that's on death row, and he has no expectation of any any freedom. He thinks he's just going going to be executed, and then at the last minute he gets a, a, a not only a stay of execution but his sentence is commuted and forgiven. Not just put on probation, but his all his uh, his crimes are forgiven. This is what that's like. I mean, the idea of that. I mean, we should all think of it in the, in those terms of we are sinners. We are on death row without Christ. Mm -hmm. So the moment we realize that He has already paid the price and He will not impute sin unto us, then that would make you happy. Think about the guy on death row. How happy would he be? How blessed would he feel if, if that were? Let me ask you to apply the, the parable Jesus uh, told us about someone who was forgiven a little bit compared to someone else who was forgiven very much. Yeah, yeah. So again, the death row inmate, <laughs> it, his uh, happiness would be bountiful, where if it was someone that was forgiven a speeding ticket, I mean, how happy would they be about that? I mean, yeah, they might not have the inconvenience of having to pay a fine and showing up in court or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good way to look at it. Um, so, so in terms of the death row inmate, he's being forgiven a lot, a lot. So I think his his joy or his happiness, um, yeah. him feeling blessed, would be in like measure to the to the um, uh, equal the crimes that were committed. Yeah. I, uh, I got in a conversation with uh, Brother Steve uh, and others in the private chat room last night. I and, love Steve. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I was making the point that I don't think God is going to be dogmatic um, and a real stickler for details when it comes to salvation. I think God is eager to save Oh my gosh! Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank so, you. Yeah, I believe that if a, if a person uh, understands that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, 
and they are believe that he's going to give them eternal life in heaven mm -hmm. and they're relying on him alone and they believe it's, it's he's guaranteed it to me i trust him i'm going to heaven but they don't understand necessarily all the details they got all all figured out exactly right i don't think god is going to say well go study and come back and try again and well now you did this you're a little closer now but study a little bit more come back again i think god is eager uh, to save people and, and it doesn't require he's not going to be dogmatic about it so the point I'm, uh, I'm making here is that um, imagine if, if I believe saving uh, given salvation to somebody God gets really happy and 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 imagine Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer I mean I saw him uh, interviewed before he he died I saw a documentary on him and he was interviewed and he became a believer and was praising Jesus and saying, yeah. I'm going to heaven because of Jesus and yeah. his mercy and grace to me. And, and he was saying all the right things. And there are people, brother, that will say, well, someone like that could never be saved. You think, are you really think Hitler could have been saved? I believe the worst people in the world, God's even more anxious to save them because they are going to appreciate it even more. Just like in the parable, how happy is the one that has so much forgiven compared to the person that has less forgiven? Amen. And I remember you used Dahmer as an example. I remember that, and they were having arguments about it. There were there were uh, uh, so-called Christians that were um, railing against him, saying that it was all fake and it was all false, and there's no way that he would be forgiven. There's no way that he's really uh, converted. And I saw the same interview that you're referring to. And I believed him. I absolutely believed him. It was coming out of his face. Now, truth is, neither one of us know, but we'll know when we get to glory. Um, but I, it's not our job to look at people and try to determine whether it's true or not. Uh, that's between him and God. So, yeah, that was a good point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. So I, we, the reason I went off on that is because it says blessed and happy and favored is the man whose sin uh, is, is uh, not charged against him. So, uh, yeah, I think not only is that person going to be super happy compared to somebody else that maybe is, was not. I've had people tell me that they think that they're, they're so horrible, they're beyond salvation. God could never forgive them because they think that they've been so horrible. And uh, I think those are the people God's going to be happiest about about uh, saving. And not only will they be happy when they understand it, how much God has forgiven them, but God will be happy uh, even more so be, uh, because it, it, it was such a miraculous, wonderful thing that, that, that was done. I, I, I always pray when, when people ask us for their prayers, they're sick or they're what, whatever they're asking for, I say, Lord, say yes say yes to this but do it in a miraculous way so everybody knows it's a miracle from you so you get all the glory and uh i think god uh i, I not only i think he's happy when we recognize it's him but uh, i think that uh, I, I i i'm happy if if uh people can recognize it hey god did that that's why i prayed one night in the when I was driving out to go street preaching, I prayed, Lord, it's pouring down rain. And, and I, I know that you're going to stop the rain while we preach. This might sound crazy to everybody, but I can't tell you how many times I went street preaching and it's pouring down rain. And, and when, but while we preach, the rain stops every time. So I knew it was going to stop raining. But I said, Lord, tonight, don't just stop the rain. Stop it just down the middle of the valley right where the street runs and let it rain everywhere else. Just like we open the Red Sea. Lord, do this so that I can tell everybody, look, this is exactly what the Lord, I asked the Lord to do is, you see it, it's God. It's not just luck that the rain stopped. And that's exactly what happened. Amen. Exactly what happened. And uh, so I like things done in a miraculous way. So there's no dispute. God gets the glory. He does. Okay. Uh, all right. You read verse uh, 
Just eight. I just did eight because I think it's so powerful. This is it. Be just read, read the next verse. Yeah, yeah. Verse nine. Um, cometh this blessedness. Well, I'll, I'll go back up to verse eight so it makes more sense. So blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Okay. Now, what what I I want to emphasize is another question mark. Mm -hmm. This is Paul's technique, mm -hmm. and he, he, I think that it's not just a technique; it's serving a big purpose. It, yeah, the tone too that I was talking about earlier. It's the it's the tone of what Paul is saying here. Absolutely. Yeah, he wants to make us think. So he's presenting it in the form of a question. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? Yes. Or upon this uncircumcision also? There it is. Uh, answer that, everybody that's listening. Is this blessed salvation only for the Jewish people or is it for all the world is what he's mm. saying. There it is. Gentiles too. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Mm. But, uh, um, so uh, it's not just some accidental thing where Paul just, you know, clumsily is putting this together and there happen to be questions here and there. He's asking questions because he wants to make you think. Because, brother, I found this to be true. Uh, here's a technique that I would ask everybody to incorporate. Uh, in your uh, in your evangelism, in your in your uh, discussions, I all say we could say your arguments, yeah. but argument is a connotation that there's some hostility or anger involved. But as you argue for the gospel with people who say faith's not enough, yeah, well, ask them. What about this verse here? It says, to the man that worketh not, but believeth on the one who justifieth the ungodly, mm -hmm. his faith is counted as righteousness. Please, will you teach me the meaning of that verse? And ask the person that's the, the false teacher, like this person that Rene was on with last week, this Bray guy or something, explain that verse to me, please. Yeah. You seem to be so knowledgeable about the Bible. You seem to be so so confident that you understand it. Will you explain that verse to me? Teach me the meaning of that verse a little bit at a time. To the man that work not, tell me, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So by making them, putting a question to them and making them think, that's what Paul's doing here. He's asking us to think. Yep. Uh, let me, let's see what it says in the Amplified here. Um, right. uh, verse verse 9. Yeah. It says, um, Is this blessing only for the circumcised or yeah. also for the uncircumcised? Mm -hmm. For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Uh, it's not, there's no great amplification there. Is there? It's just state, restating it, basically. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse 10. Yeah, please. How it, how was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision? <laughs> See, again, it's this, it's the attitude that, that Paul has here. It, 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 it's incredulous. It's like it's like saying to someone, you're you're making a point and you feel like they understand, but yet he keeps hearing things again, about about works rather than faith and uh, about being circumcised as opposed to being uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it's again, it's that attitude of saying, is this what is this the way the, the way this is? Or is it what you know in your hearts that it's it's that mm -hmm. all Gentiles and um, Jews are all in the same boat. We're all under the same God. We're all um able to accept God's free gift and have the the imputed righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
the, 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 but again, he's got more questions. Yeah. And again, I believe using the technique, Paul, he used the technique of prosopopoeia. Go back to the, the, uh, the second uh, Wednesday of this Bible study uh, when, when we did our acting, playing out the parts. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm convinced that's the way it makes the most sense uh, that it was prosopopoeia. That's a technique, an oratory technique to help us understand. And, and this te is a technique. Questions. He's asking you questions, making you think, trying to get you to come up with the answer yourself. Have you ever, brother, have you ever found that some people will not learn because they won't let you teach them? They're too proud to, yeah. to ever think that someone, you could actually have something to teach them. Yeah. But if you ask them questions and you make them think and they can come to the, 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 the understanding on their own by you just asking the right questions, then they don't think that you're teaching them. They think that they figured it out themselves and then their pride doesn't prevent them. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you think you can learn from a child? Of course. Yes, of course. But there are people that don't think they can learn from a new believer or they can't learn from someone that's just recently saved. I've learned I've learned from new believers a lot over the years. Absolutely. And and yeah. you've learned from children. Children say things sometimes that come out of their mouth and it's strange. I mean, I, 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 gosh, it's happened to me. Um, the viewpoint of a child, you know, the way that they think, the way they view the world without all the um, all the covering up and all the, the pain that the world seems to cause and all the jaded, uh, the, just being jaded by the way things operate. To a child, the whole world is a wonder. They're looking at it from a completely different perspective. Also, they want to sin and how they have so Christ on them. And they're that death, that, that guy on death row. And they're looking at it where people rugby to be flung on, they get beat up constantly by things like and it's easy for them to be prideful, unfortunately. So from a place of pride, it's very, very easy to brother, brother, the last thirty seconds your audio went really bad. It was all broken up. So uh, I don't know if you changed anything, uh, your microphone position or, or what, but it was bad. So uh, no, uh, actually, I'm I'm in a uh, landline. I'm in a direct landline, so I don't know what would have caused that. But uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully the uh, it'll not continue because it was like like every other word was missing. But let's look at Hendrix's comment here. It's a good point. Uh, verse 10, saying Abraham was saved before he did anything, but simply believed God's promise. Very important point. And, and that's what, that's what it's, he's, uh, uh, um, that's what uh, um, it's really, uh, the point is here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, let me read that in the Amplified. Because uh, you nailed it, uh, Hendricks. He says in the Amplified, how then was it credited to him? Was it after he had been circumcised or before? Not after, but while he was uncircumcised. See, um, um, that's what the verse. Oh, there he goes. That's yeah, not me. Can anyone hear me? Hello? Hello. Can anyone hear me? Oh, I see Hendrix said that you can hear me. Well, I won't disconnect then. Yeah, he's uh okay guys. Uh Luke is not on the call now. 
Um, I'm looking at a, a link that says that I'm in the call by myself, waiting for people to join the video call. All right, so um, I'm going to call Brother Luke. Guys, just stand by. I'm going to mute my microphone. Just stand by a second. I'm going to give him a phone call real quick and see if I can get him back on the connection. So just uh, stand by. Sorry about the difficulties. I'll give him a call. All right, guys. So I just talked to uh, Brother Luke, and he's trying to get reconnected again. So um, I guess I'll just talk to you guys real quick. How's everybody doing? So we got uh, Hendrix. Thanks for letting me know that you could hear me. That's awesome. Um, hello, Jessica Dominguez. Uh, thank you for also telling me that you could hear me. Hendrix, yeah, it could be. The enemy's out against us tonight, brethren. Yes, that's uh, that could be true. Um, I don't think I've ever done a broadcast with him, uh, where it was, uh, where there was any kind of issue whatsoever, but, um, it happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Rod, that they are, Rod, please stand by. This is a public service announcement brought to you by Combo Plate. Uh, let's see who else do we have. Hey, Sarah Jane, how are you? Hope everything's going well with you. Uh, Stacy Cook, Amanda Gill, Amanda, good to see you. Awesome. Uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to look at the chat in a while. Golgotha, as usual, buddy, how are you? Hello, Natalie. Hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, Melted Zone. How are you, buddy? Everything good with you? I rebuke the weather then. That's good. In the name of Jesus, I'm with you. Um, I didn't realize he was having bad weather. Then that's good. There he is. I'm with you. Okay. Um, Can you hear me? I didn't yep. realize he was having you bad turn your sound down. That's okay. good. There he is. Let me uh let me mute that. Okay. One. Yep. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm I joined based upon the link uh, that I sent you, but I I'm not on as like the host. I'm here like a a panelist so oh, that's fine we can you, yeah i don't know what it well how to get back on uh as the host unless i close it and start a brand new one but let's just hope that this will, will continue uh does i sound okay now you sound great actually uh all right then let me get uh, back to the the uh get my pop-up thing back in here like we did uh yes sir let's see I was just saying hello to the chat room while while we waited. One second. Did everybody uh, miss me? Um, I think everyone except Hendrix. He was saying something about maybe I should be the new host. Yeah, well, I'm glad, you're, <laughs> I'm I'm glad you have to go do that when when I'm not able. <laughs> I was just he did not say that. <laughs> yeah, he didn't say it. Hendrix, that sounds like what Hendrix would say. Though, I know that, that's why I said it because it did. It did sound a little bit like something you would say. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let me see if I can get uh, the uh, verses back up now. Okay. Okay. Well, Romans chapter four. Romans. Yeah. Four. Okay. I think we All were right. going to read uh, verse twelve. Uh, let me see. No, I think we're on verse eleven. You read, we read, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, we read 10. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead and read read 11 if you would. I sure would. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, 